Here's Ben Shapiro to misunderstand what intersectionality is. To say that, like, I, I think white women need to kind of step up their game, to be quite honest. Like, sorry, but I'm calling I'm calling out like um, <laughs> you really do. Because, like, you know, there's like we can I couldn't agree more with everything that that these brilliant women are saying. But like, I, I'm also seeing the silent killer, which is a lot of white women at the top who are kind of reinforcing a lot of old ideas. They're, they're... If you're now thinking, what the hell are you talking about? You haven't spent much time on a modern college campus. I've spent lots of time on modern college campuses, and I still don't know what that discussion was about because the clip you showed provided barely any context. Intersectionality is a form of identity politics in which the value of your opinion depends on how many victim groups you belong to. No, it has nothing to do with the value of your opinion. I think Ben is getting intersectionality mixed up with standpoint theory. Intersectionality is the idea that people who are subjected to multiple kinds of bigotry experience at least the cumulative effects of those kinds of bigotry. For example, if you're black, anti-blackness will be aimed in your direction. If you're a woman, misogyny will be aimed in your direction. If you are a black woman, both anti-blackness and misogyny will be aimed in your direction. This is common sense. Standpoint theory is the idea that people who are members of particular groups largely have more credibility when describing the mistreatment of those groups than people who are not members. This is also common sense because it applies to the very uncontroversial idea that first-hand eyewitness testimony is generally more reliable than second- or third-hand testimony. At the bottom of the totem pole is the person everybody loves to hate, the straight white male. And who's at the top? Well, it's very hard to say, because new groups claim victim status all the time. No one can keep track. So, how does this intersectionality thing play out? Something like this. Let's say you're a gay white woman. As, as a queer woman... Your opinion matters, but less than that of a gay black woman. Ben talks about how much one's opinion matters, as if this applies to just any opinion they may have whatsoever. This is not what the folks he's criticizing advocate. If you are a gay black woman, your account of what it is like to be a gay black woman is a first-hand account, while the gay white woman's account of what it's like to be a gay black woman would be a second-hand account at best. And the deference and credibility granted to their two accounts ought to be proportional to the deference and credibility you would give to a first-hand account over a second-hand account. Ceteris Paribus, of course. Why? Because while all women are oppressed by the patriarchy, and all gays are oppressed by the heterosexual majority, blacks have a victim status that whites obviously don't. Like, the guy at the top's louder. It's, it's harder to say, like, I think this should be a black writer. Of course, a gay black woman's victim status is less than that of a black trans woman, who ranks below a black Muslim trans woman, and so on. The more memberships you can claim in oppressed groups, the more aggrieved you are, and the higher you rank. The higher you rank in what? The only thing you would rank higher in is credibility when speaking about what it's like to be a member of all of those groups. And if you believe that first-hand eyewitness testimony ranks more highly in credibility than hearsay, then there is no reason to oppose giving a higher ranking to the credibility of someone who is a member of multiple groups which are subjected to bigotry with respect to what they have to say about what it's like to be subjected to those multiple bigotries. Get it? Good. Because it's about to get even more complicated. It hasn't gotten complicated at all yet. First-hand accounts are usually more reliable than second-hand accounts. That's the essence of the idea you're talking about. It's pretty simple. Intersectionality takes your victim status and uses it as the basis for creating alliances with other victim groups. I'll just speak from my own personal experience. It's just like, I wasn't sure how to be an ally. I wasn't sure what type, I got so caught up in like what kind of terminology I was supposed to be using. Here's the logic. A black gay and a Hispanic gay may not belong to the same victim group racially, but they do belong to the same victim group on the basis of their sexuality. By focusing on the places where various victim identities intersect, intersectionality creates a united us versus them paradigm. Righteous victims rising up together to fight the oppressor, those dreaded straight white men. This explains why at a rally protesting the treatment of Palestinians by you might see a contingent of lesbian activists. That's intersectionality at work. Whenever I've heard a proponent of intersectionality explain why you would see LGBT activists at a Palestinian rights rally, they never make it that complicated. Rather, a significant reason why you see LGBT activists protest the treatment of Palestinians by Israel is because LGBT Palestinians are subjected to that same treatment. That some professor tucked away in an ivory tower would come up with this nonsense is not surprising. 
I guess that was supposed to be a cartoon of Kimberly Crenshaw who developed the theory of intersectionality. She's holding a sign that says all minorities are victims, as though that's something she said, which of course she didn't. Intersectionality in no way says that all minorities are victims. The white folks who used to run South Africa were a minority. They certainly weren't victims. In the US, there are only 97 men for every 100 women, and intersectionality certainly does not say that American men are therefore victims. Also, Ben dismissively says says that she came up with this idea from an ivory tower. This implies that he thinks that someone in such a privileged position has less credibility when they speak about oppression. Which is ironic because if that's what he means, he is applying the very principle that he's mocking. What is surprising and disturbing is that so many people actually go along with it. As I started to rise in television, I started to just get more blunt and just start saying like, I would like a black writer. Because if I said diverse, no, don't you know, you, you, get, you get, well, white is diverse, which is something somebody said to me. And I was like, wow. wow. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was like, it's not cool, but um, but but to really, you know, I, I reached out to my, you know, um, uh, the, the women that I respect who are who are, are not white um, writers and directors, and I said, what should I say? What what lang how what language should I use? You know, and and I think it's worth it if you're in a position of um, hiring power or or uh, green lighting power to like reach out to people that are not like you and say, what can I do to be an ally? And and how can I I, how can I support um, writers of color and um, um, LG, LGBTQ and disabled writers? Like, what can I do? Ben seems to think that the reason she wants to be an ally is because of shared victim status and to gang up against straight white males. However, this implies that straight white males are not encouraged to be allies themselves when they absolutely are. And the reason she seems to be pushing for more writers who are marginalized to be hired doesn't seem to be because their opinions are all inherently more valuable, but rather to counter interact the discrimination they face. Intersectionality promotes the biggest hoax of all, that we aren't individuals who are to be judged on the basis of how we act, but are merely members of groups to be judged on the basis of our group identity. No, it is the very common sense idea that folks who are members of multiple marginalized groups experience multiple forms of bigotry. It doesn't assert that every member of every group has identical experiences of these bigotries, or that you can judge a person on the basis of membership in any group. This is an essentialist view that many intersectional feminists explicitly reject. In fact, the whole point of intersectionality is that an individual cannot be reduced to being a member of any single group, because each individual is a member of a unique combination of groups. As Trina Grio says, in her paper Anti-Essentialism and Intersectionality, the perceived need to define what women's experience is and what oppression as women means has prompted some feminists to analyze the situation of woman by stripping away race and class. To be able to separate out the oppressions of race and class, as well as sexual orientation and other bases of oppressions, the theory goes, we must look at someone who is not experiencing those oppressions and then we will see what oppression on the basis of gender alone looks like. This approach, however, assumes that the strands of identity are separable that the experience of a white woman dealing with a white man or raising a white child is the same experience that a black woman has dealing with a black man or raising a black child. So rather than neglecting a person's individual circumstances, intersectionality emphasizes their importance. It encourages the opposite of what Ben accuses it of encouraging. Also, Ben talks about intersectionality as though it's about judging a person's moral worth or value as a person, which isn't the case. It's about understanding people's experiences and how they influence their interactions with the world. It is not a judgment of a person's value. In other words, you and I as individuals with our unique experiences, thoughts, and ambitions count for nothing. Our racial and sexual identity count for everything. That is the exact opposite of what intersectionality teaches. To everyone who helps me out on Patreon, you're a big help. Thanks so much.